I am very excited and uh, honored to introduce our uh, first speaker this morning, who's Jonathan Blow. Uh, Jonathan is a friend of mine and someone uh, whose work I really deeply respect. Uh, there are some game designers that I sort of have very elaborate models of in my head and kind of like refer to them and think, oh, what would, what would that person do? What would that person do in this situation? What would that person think about this? And uh, Jonathan is definitely one of those people for me. It's, uh, I really admire and, and respect his work, but also and especially his, his whole approach, right? He has, I think of, of all the game designers I know, I don't think anyone is quite as seriously committed to the idea of the importance of the work that we do as game designers and the kind of, really the kind of moral imperative that we have to think seriously about what we're making and the relationship that, that we have, the responsibility to the player to, to explore I, our, our ideas deeply and, and to kind of like uncover uh, the, the, the truth and uncover the, the beauty of the things that we're exploring. Um, so, uh, you know, obviously Braid was a monumentally important game historically, uh, a, a wonderful game and something that kind of in many ways kind of ushered in uh, a, a, an era of thoughtful, mindful, um, small-scale, personally driven uh, uh, work reaching a broad audience. And, um, and then for the past few years, he's been working on The Witness, which looks beautiful and mysterious and, and cool, and I, I can't wait for it to come out. Um, and as that work is, is coming to a close, uh, Jonathan's gonna tell us a little bit about uh, how he's thinking about his process and and the ideas that that he's developing um, and maybe even a little peek into what's coming next so um, please join me in welcoming Jonathan Blow how do I get my screen here oh. this is the thing oh yes. wait I gotta just All right. Well, thanks for that very nice introduction. Um, it's a little bit redundant with my introduction, but that's how these things go. So yeah, um, this is the game of mine that most of you may have had an opportunity to play at least, and it's, uh, it's on display out there in the hall. Um, this is a game I've been working on for quite a long time, The Witness. And um, unfortunately, it's not done yet. It's pretty close to done. Um, I would be very happy if it were in your hands today, but it's going to be a little bit longer, not too much. Um, where this game is, is that, you know, what you would consider as the game design is done. We're doing polishy things, uh, both program repolish and design polish. I might rebuild and redesign about 10 or 15 puzzles, um, which sounds like a lot until you realize there's 670 puzzles in the game, and then it doesn't seem like all so much. Um, and it's been, a, it's been a very rewarding and gratifying project, even if at times it has been uh, long and difficult to work on. But because the design's been basically done, even for the past year, you know, we've been kind of 80, 90 percent done, right? We've been in that last 80 percent. Um, so I've had a lot of time to think about and prepare for what am I going to do next, right? Um, and it's, it's led to a lot of introspection. Like today, where, where do I see myself as a practitioner of game design really right now? Because when I go out in public and talk about The Witness at conferences, you know, I'm sort of referring to ideas that I had at the start of The Witness that prompted the development of that game, right? And so uh, for the past four or five years, I've been talking about 2008 or 2007 in my own personal timeline and where I am with ideas. And if you do that too long, it'll stunt your growth, right? So even though this game isn't completely done, it's time to do a new thing. Um, but to tell you how I feel about all this, uh, let's, let's talk about something like space exploration, right? Um, 
this is a little bit of a meme at this point, but for good reason. Like we used to do cool stuff like sending people to the moon. Uh, you know, we, we did, I think, six moon missions before we decided that there was no longer the sort of xenophobic imperative to keep doing moon missions. And they were really expensive. Uh, so then eventually we came up with this thing called the space shuttle that was kind of cool in its own way. I mean, it was pretty complicated and unwieldy, but um, result of bureaucratic processes. But it was a reusable space vehicle, and this was supposed to take us into the future, right? It was supposed to be the first of a line of reusable space vehicles. And once you can reuse your space vehicle, you can have all sorts of cool ships flying around like in Buck Rogers or something, right? There was, there was some kind of linkage between then and now. But, you know, um, as, as we all know, uh, the space shuttle got kind of old and busted. A few of them exploded. The rest of them are now mothballed. And so now our space program is something like this, uh, where we still have an international space station, sort of, and we send supplies up there to a small number of people. And then we do this kind of uh, landing unmanned probes on places like Mars or uh, comets now, which is pretty cool. And I don't want to go into this talk diminishing the size of these kind of accomplishments. These are amazing accomplishments uh, that are the outcome of a large number of very smart people working for a very long time. It's, it's kind of amazing that we can do this. However, <laughs> if you rewind to the early 1970s and look at the, you know, having done some moon landings and projected forward into the future, where would we be in 2014? You probably wouldn't have pictured this. You probably would have pictured something a lot cooler than this. Um, so I'm not the only person who feels this way. You know, there's a venture capital fund called Founders Fund whose tagline is, you know, they promised us flying cars and all we got was 140 characters. And I'm very sympathetic. Uh, you know, it, it makes me root for uh, Founders Fund a lot more than most VCs I know of, which I don't have too high opinion of. Um, even if some of their portfolio companies make me a little bit nervous in terms of the vision of what they're trying to do. Uh, <laughs> so, well, I won't go into that. Um, <laughs> a, a, you know, there's other people. So Elon Musk has a couple of companies that are really trying to shape the future, you know. Um, he's got SpaceX, which is uh, looking at this problem of space exploration and, and attempting to be very ambitious about it and so far making good strides. You know, he tells this story where, um, you know, he one day went to NASA's website because he got excited about Mars and he wanted to look on the roadmap for like, okay, when when does humanity start a colony on Mars, right? How far in the future is that? Even if it's 50 years, 70 years, you'd figure there was a roadmap. And he says, well, no, they had nothing. There was, there was no concept of going to Mars that NASA would speak publicly about. And he felt that this was a big problem, right? So this is his way of addressing that problem. Um, it's kind of impressive so far. You know, they, they now dock satellites with the International Space Station on occasion. And uh, I don't think it'll be too long before they're doing bigger things than that. Uh, his other company, Tesla, down here, um, has been another example of uh, making the future happen uh, in direct counter to what everybody thinks is possible or likely. You know, um, If you even go back five years ago, the public rhetoric about electric cars um, was that they were an idealist thing that was never going to work. Um, you know, I mean, I, I had lunch once with someone from, a, um, you know, Ca California, some board in the state of California about sustainability and future transport, right? And she was like, oh, electric cars are dumb. You know, they're never going to work. Uh, but they apparently do work. So there are now 50,000 Tesla Model S's out in the public and more every day. And there's this giant charging network. You know, if you go back to 2008, 2007, which is not that long ago, that's when Braid came out. I hope that's not that long ago. Um, the rhetoric behind electric cars was like, oh, well, they're little, uh, you know, they're, they're tiny little golf carts that are, that are kind of cheesy, right? They're not like real big gas cars. Well, you know, Tesla just announced a car that goes zero to 60 in 3.2 seconds, which is so fast there's really just a tiny handful of cars in the world that are faster than that. So that's kind of amazing. Um, and then the other argument that you would hear all the time was like, look, you just can't, 
electric cars are never going to happen because there's no infrastructure. Like, oh my God, you would somehow have to make charging everywhere, and that's impossible, right? Now, never mind, for example, that we all have pressurized water into everybody's house. Do you think about like how much water moves and it's clean and it somehow crosses great distances and you just turn this tap? It's like way harder to move water than electricity, but we did that a long time ago, right? Um, but then, you know, I, clearly it's not that hard because Tesla just stood up and said, okay, we'll build an infrastructure, right? And so all these dots on this map are charging stations and they're adding more dots. And you can charge your car pretty fast at any of these. And this is something that even I, as an electric car enthusiast, wouldn't have pictured possible in 2007 or 8 that they would make this much progress this fast. So this stands in stark contrast to like everything else that's happening, which is kind of very slow, lethargic, whatevering. Right? Once in a while, people sort of stand up and say, screw it, we're going to do this, and they do it, and the results are really kind of impressive. So in general, out in the world, there's a relatively small number of people um, who I consider to be part of an ambitious project movement, right? I don't think this movement has a name. It's just people who, who care about the future and are not defeatist about it. Right? Who, who believe that there are really good things to do yet. Um, you know, I see things in my daily life that, that frustrate me uh, in this matter all the time. So this is the San Francisco Bay Bridge that goes from Oakland to San Francisco. And on the left is the old version of the bridge, which was built in 1930s. And you can also see a piece of it in the background on the left. And on the right <coughs> is the new replacement span uh, because you know, the, the bridge on the left was getting old and it was past its, we were using it past its projected lifetime anyway and there was earthquake damage and it, it had to be replaced, right? Um, the original bridge, the whole original bridge was built in the 1930s in three and a half years. It cost $77 million at the time, right? So this replacement of not even the whole bridge, just the eastern span, took 11 years cost $6.4 billion, which if you adjust for inflation is five or six times as much as the old bridge. Um, and with technology, 70 years in the future from the old bridge. So s what, what happened, right? Like somehow you would think that the technology would make us a lot more awesome at public works construction or just the experience. Like we have 70 more years of experience at public works than we had back then. And yet, uh, this didn't seem to go very well, right? And again, we're not even talking about replacing the whole bridge. That's like still an old bridge back there that I drive on all the time. Um, now, it might look like the new bridge is a lot bigger or something, but it's not really because the old bridge is like two layers on top of each other with one direction going one way and the other direction going the other way. And the new bridge is just two layers side by side. So, you know, it looks bigger and maybe you don't have something on top of you, but it's essentially a project of the same size. So, like, what the hell happened there, right? Like, every day that I drive on that bridge, I'm like, what? Where is this pro promise of technology, right? Where did it bring us? Um, and and the, the worst thing about this, right, is when I say this, probably nobody in this room is shocked by a story of a construction project that took a long time and was expensive, right? This is like the new normal for construction and why? Why? Why is that? Let's think about that. Um, anyway, so another person <clears throat> who I sort of classify in this movement of people interested in the future <clears throat> is science fiction author Neil Stevenson. You know, he started giving some talks a few years ago about the moon landing and other big projects and was concerned that as a society, we may have lost our ability to do big things and what happened, right? Why are we so bad at, at big ambitious things? And he wondered, being a science fiction author, well, what role does science fiction play in this and what can I do about it, right? So he started this initiative called Project Hieroglyph, which um, they actually just have a book of short stories that just came out and the stories are about uh, recapturing a little bit of that science fiction spirit, the um, optimism about the future and the ability of people to be smart and do big things, which is what a lot of science fiction like to be, used to be like a while ago. And then sometime, maybe around the 80s, you know, it all became dystopian, you know, cyberpunk, post-apocalyptic future. The future sucks and is horrible and is corporate stuff. And um, he 
felt that science fiction writers have a role to play here and that they had sort of been, um, I don't want to put words in his mouth, but you know, I, I won't. I'll just say that there's a bundle of issues there. <clears throat> now I'm, I'm very sensitive to uh, the ability of fiction to inspire. Uh, this book here is uh, Gravity's Rainbow, which is really, I think, a very interesting book. Um, I've read it twice. Last time that I read it was in 2013, uh, early to mid-2013, when I was still in development on The Witness, and it had been becoming a very long project. It was going on four and a half, five years, something like that at that time, which is longer than most people ever work on games to begin with. Um, but because it was over a year and a half from now, we were not really anywhere near the end. I wanted very much to be near the end, but I was more like wandering through the desert, like, oh my God, I kind of maybe someday will know what the end looks like when I see it, but I look around and I don't see it. I just see dunes everywhere, right? Um, so it's a very difficult time as a creative person. And, you know, I read this book again. I knew what I was in for because I'd read it before, but I read this book again and when I started reading it, I just had this attitude like, oh my God, this is impossible. How am I ever going to finish this project, right? This is terrible. And, you know, here I held in my hands this work of great complexity and great ambition that was just beautiful, right? And um, the book was sort of saying to me like, yes, this kind of thing that you're trying to do, it's possible, right? It's, there are people who do this successfully. Um, and it's interesting to me, uh, and, and so that book kind of kept me going, right? It, it really, uh, I almost can't verbalize, right? But I, I love this book is all I can really say. Like I have feelings for this book that I don't have for most things, um, <laughs> including most games, including almost any games. And so why, you know, I'm a person who cares about games. I think about games all the time. I make games all the time. Why did I have to get inspiration from a book, right? Like, isn't that, what's wrong with that picture? Okay, so, you know, I'm getting toward the end of The Witness and I'm wondering what's next. And if you look at this trend, it's, it's maybe working, right? <laughs> Braid uh, took three and a half years in development, which seemed like a really long time at the time. By the time The Witness is done, it'll be about six and a half years. And I have a question mark there, because who knows? It could take longer. Um, but I'm hoping for six and a half years. And uh, so you kind of have to look at that trend line when you wonder what I'm going to do next. Like, if you extrapolate this geometric progression, you get 12.07 years, uh, which, which seems like a long time. And I don't think, I just described to you that I had some difficulty in the middle of a six and a half year process and I don't think I want to do that again but well I don't think I want to do that again right um, so any hypothetical game three um, I feel like hey I would like to do it I'd like to pop out a game in about two years which is still a lot of people feel like that's a really long time but but for me at this point two years is like having lunch or something right like you're you're done and like two years is over and you've hopefully got something. Uh, now I'm saying game three here, that's a little bit of a facetious name because uh, first of all, because I've actually made way more than three games anyway, but you know, since I sort of found myself as a designer, the number of major commercially released games is sort of two now. And, and so this would be the third one. But the other reason it's facetious is this may not actually be the next game that ends up in people's hands. I may do like little palate cleanser things or something, but this is the next major thing, the next thing that I really care a lot about. So, you know, I care a lot about it, but I would like to make games in two years, and actually that feels a little bit conceptually incompatible to me because, um, you know, I really like, uh, I really like the difference in depth and understanding that I've gained from going from a shorter project to a, to a longer project. Um, the Witness is just a much more thorough and mature and grounded game than Braid was. And, you know, part of that is probably just me being better as a designer because I've done more things. 
but part of it is really the calendar time that is available when designing the game, right? All the time during Braid and The Witness, you know, I have some vision for what I'm trying to do, and I start nailing it, like, oh, this is great, and that's great, and then I come to some situation, and it's like, well, I'm trying to make a puzzle or a moment in this game that fits what I need here, and everything I'm doing is terrible and like forced and ugly and I just don't know what to do but I've painted myself in a corner I need something here because the rest of the game is built around this thing that happens um, you know not infrequently and what I've learned when that happens is you know if I just walk away and give it some calendar time I can come back in two weeks or two months sometimes in a year or two years um, what I find is that I usually have a really good answer for that thing that I was stumped on and who knows whether that's because my subconscious has been working on it or because I allowed myself to go work on other parts of the game and then come back. Now I have more experience at this specific game and know what it needs, right? Um, it's probably a collection of reasons that are causative of that situation, but I find it very beneficial. And so this game is tremendously better, I think, than it would be if we'd had to put it out in like two years. Like if I'd had a lot more money Right? and just had a giant team and was like, okay, let's go, let's start making this thing. Um, I don't think it would be anywhere near as good as it is. And so this is the dilemma that I have is that I want to make things on a much shorter time scale, but I don't want to sacrifice quality. So ideally, I would just jump on the other side of that geometric progression and do something for 20 years. Um, because, uh, you know, think about that. In 20 years, you could really understand a couple of things. Um, <laughs> I mean, games are complicated, right? So, so here's uh, what I've sort of concluded is that I'm going to do both in one project. So what I'm calling game three is conceived as a 20 year long project, but not as one continuous block of time. And I'm calling it game three for the purposes of this talk, but in the way that it manifests in the world would be as a series of individual playable games um, but not really episodic in the way that it's commonly thought of um, because, you know, when you think about an episodic game, usually the episodes have to do with story, right, or something like that. Um, and this is more like games that relate to each other in terms of game design, right? There's some core principle that's the foundation of this 20-year project, and these games revisit that principle from different angles. Um, right, which will allow me as an author to keep uh, looking into this same subject matter in different ways and deepen my investigation with each game, right? And yet, because they're individual pieces, I can do those pieces maybe, hopefully, on a two or let's let's be realistic and say if I aim for two, it'll be three or something, but a shorter time scale. Right now, if this doesn't make too much sense, like what what even is that structure? Um, an analogy that's not too far off might be like these uh, book series is that fantasy authors and sometimes sci-fi authors do, right? Where each individual book can actually be a very sophisticated and complex thing, right? In fact, that's why people love these kind of things, right? This isn't like the Hardy Boys or something where they knock out a hundred books that somebody wrote in two days each, right? Um, it's something that somebody really crafted, right? So something like that where, where each piece stands on its own, but they add together to make something big, right? In one of these fantasy series, as the installments come out, um, you eventually get this really big tapestry of this really big uh, world, right? So what would it be like if you did that, not really for plot and setting and story? I mean, you could do plot and setting and story, but what if you did that about gameplay, right? How interesting would that, would that be? Um, so I've sort of covered part of this, right? Why, part of the motivation of doing a 20 year long project is that calendar time. And it doesn't just help me solve problems, like I mentioned, but but solve problems in a quality way, right? Like t in, in a way that really um, speaks to the subject of the game in a deep way and in a way that helps create magic. Like you can't force magic, right? Th those moments when somebody's playing a game and they were like, oh my God, what, what just happened, right? Um, that was amazing. Like those, 
you kind of can't crank those out on a schedule or out of a factory, I don't think. I haven't learned how to do that yet. Um, so, so time will help with that. Uh, and then the other thing is, um, is my personal agenda or my personal interest in building this really vast and beautiful tapestry. And, you know, I, I don't think that every game should do that or have to do that, right? Small games are very beautiful as well, but um, there's something about my personal way that I'm using games to look at the world, right? Like, the, the, there's sort of a way that I see game design. It fluctuates from day to day or year to year, but there's a general department of how I see game design. And I can use that as a lens to, to turn back and see the rest of the world. And um, it's very hard to describe what that is, but it's something about the world being comprised of, you know, subjective moments that are unpredictable in advance, but that combine in a complex way to generate something even more unpredictable, like a bigger surprise at every moment, right? The world um, never stops with surprise. And when you really like see that, when you really sit back and look at things that way, um, what you can see or, or what I see is it's, it's so immense, right? It's so unfathomable that you, al you almost basically can't do anything, right? It's just like paralysis of, of being faced by the universe. And so you can't, you know, in building something measly like a game, you can't actually do justice to that grandness and that big thing. Um, but from within my tiny human form, I want to I wanna try, right? I want to express something of this grandness and this vastness and help people get a glimpse of the way that, that I see it. And uh, something vast relative to my tiny self and my tiny brain and what it can hold is one way to do that. So, you know, I've been talking in abstractions so far, but I want to say some things to clarify. I've actually already built a prototype of the first installment of this game. I started building it at GDC last year, 2013. Um, I've since put in over a year of spare time and weekend work. Um, you know, while I was working on The Witness during the day, I'd go home or do a coffee shop and I'd work on this game at night. Um, it's now got 40 to 60 hours of gameplay. And the reason I can stand up here and tell you that this is my next project is because those 40 to 60 hours of gameplay are really good. They're a worthy successor to anything in Braid or The Witness, right? Um, It's not a puzzle game, though, uh, which is cool, because I wanted to make something that's not a puzzle game. Um, but even though it's not a puzzle game, I do get to an effectively employ the, the sense of game design that I've developed over the last two games. Um, and I've had a lot of fun doing that. So <clears throat> this is a talk that Mark Ten Bosch and I gave at Indicade 2011, um, which is the closest that I've ever come to laying out how I design games, like what are the things that I think about? And we sort of presented it a little bit as a system or, you know, sets of bullet points or sets of concerns because that's how people want to hear things and it makes it easier to digest. Um, I don't really believe in a specific system of game design. I think it's way more of an art than that. Um, but anyway, this is, this is available on YouTube and it's the closest that, that I've ever come to laying out exactly what I do from day to day. Um, now, the, one of the questions or concerns that I often get from this talk and, and, and one or two related things is people, uh, people say, well, those ideas are all fine and grand, but they only apply to puzzle games. They don't apply to my game. And uh, I didn't believe people who said that at the time. It felt to me like that was the response of someone who just didn't want to think about the ideas that hard or didn't want to really look at them or apply them to their situation. And I can report that that is actually true uh, because I've used these ideas to build a non-puzzle game and it came out great. Uh, so while I have the, uh, the possibility of a tangent, 
let me talk about the GDC and the state of the game industry and link it to the moon landing and say all kinds of bad things. <laughs> so, you know, I, I started designing this game at GDC 2013. Um, oh, and I, I don't want to focus on GDC. I want to also talk about basically every other game conference in the world. This conference excluded, of course. <laughs> um, so, uh, you know, I was, I was making this game uh, during the actual conference. At, at the start of the conference, I did my usual thing of the last several years at GDC, which is I start looking at the schedule. I'm like, oh my, no, 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 I don't want to see any of this stuff, right? That year, especially, I was dismayed by how much terrible social game stuff was going on, right? Monetize your whatever. I just didn't want to hear any of that. Um, and, you know, really something had been brewing for a long time. And I was like, this is stupid. Uh, you know, there were a couple things that might have looked interesting. And I went to one, and it was terrible. And I went to another, and it was OK, you know. But the OK ones, it's like, oh, I can, I can catch that on video after, right? So I felt like this was a giant locus of activity of a lot of people doing activities and saying things and like I didn't care one iota about what anybody had to say and that was as soon as I made that clear to myself it was a really strange realization like it's not really GDC's problem I mean you know when, when people organize a conference they obviously can shape that conference and they've made some choices that I don't agree with but really the problem is what most of the people in the game industry are interested in doing and talking about right now it really has nothing to do with what I'm interested in doing and talking about um, now you know I'm not a professional mathematician or a professional physicist but I have a little bit of interaction with those circles and my impression of a conference in math or physics is that when you go to it as a seasoned uh, professional or Academician, I don't know what you are. You a professional? No. no. <laughs> Whatever. As, as as a seasoned person in the field, when you go to those, you actually are interested in the content of the talks and things. You know, even if even if you've read a preprint or whatever, like there's a lot of material being presented that's really difficult to absorb, and that's actually objectively about things that might be interesting in the world. And so. Um, like, people actually go to these conferences expecting to learn things and getting better at their field, right? At game conferences, it's not really true anymore. It used to be true a long time ago. Um, but nowadays, like, nobody who's really experienced at game development goes to a game conference expecting to really learn things. Um, you know, you might get lucky and learn a couple of small things. <laughs> Um, over the course of your three or four days, right? For, for most of us who have been in the industry a while, um, usually what happens, there's a little bit of like fear of missing out. Like I, I, I wanna go because maybe if I don't go, I'll miss something, right? There's a little bit of like, oh, I get to see all my colleagues who I only get to see once a year and maybe I'll have a conversation with one of them and learn something interesting, some insight about what they're developing, right? So it doesn't really come from the conference, it comes from like a small number of individuals that I might meet. Right now, that's not true for beginners. Like these conferences are very valuable if you haven't been in the industry for a long time, um, because there's just so much context that you haven't seen, right? And there's just so much that you can learn just by being exposed to it. But as you get more and more experienced, this like cone of what is relevant just keeps shrinking, right? And it eventually shrinks down to zero, um, disturbingly quickly, actually, after probably about three years if you're really paying attention. Um, so, but, but it's still really good for beginners, except <laughs> there's a poison in these conferences and in this community. And I've been living in it for so long that it didn't become clear to me until I sat down to prepare this talk. Uh, and that is, you know, there's this malaise of the experienced in the game industry, right? Everybody who's been in the industry for a long time um, has a certain... Everyone is a blanket word, but basically everyone has a certain cynicism um, or a certain, uh, you know, grizzled veterinality, right? Um, for a variety of reasons, right? Because we've been through long projects, because we've been through projects that we had high hopes for and that came out badly, because we had projects canceled under us when the publisher didn't see the promise and pulled funding, because we had to do 
you know, all the programming that some stupid designer thought was going to be a good idea that was obviously terrible. Like, all these reasons contribute, right? And uh, it's this weird thing where it's like that science fiction is all about dystopian, post-apocalyptic cyberpunk futures. Like, that's what everyone's vision of the game industry is like. And that gets communicated by osmosis onto the beginners. And, and that's really unhealthy. And, and I would say it's a reason for beginners maybe to stay away from these conferences. Um, the other interesting aspect of this is that if you go to conferences, um, they're always sure to schedule inspirational speakers in one or two slots. And the thing about inspirational speaking I don't know if, if all inspirational speaking is like this, but in the games industry, it's usually fake, right? Um, it's usually like someone's got a really hard situation, and then they get up and they're like, yeah, inspiration, and then they go back and they're sad about their life, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> you know, they're faking it till they make it, and then they probably don't make it, and you don't hear about them <laughs> after a couple years. So why do we even g go to that, right? So it's, there's a whole situation here, is all I'm saying. Um, but it's even worse for design than it is for some other departments, right? Because when I talk about this grizzled veteranness, right, usually my picture for that is tech people, simply because there are tech people that have been around a while, right? So if I think back 20 years ago to people who were doing the really big stuff that was very inspiring and ambitious and like, oh my God, I wish I could do that, right? It's people like, uh, you know, John Carmack, Tim Sweeney, Mike Abrash, those guys, right? Those guys are still around. They're still in games. And they're still doing stuff that's impressive and relevant. Um, I don't think in any of those cases it's quite as amazing as what they did back in, in the day, right? But, but they're, still, they're still working hard and, and being very productive and really contributing to what's going on in games. Think about game designers, right? How many game designers who were doing the things that were heralded 20 years ago are A, still in games, <laughs> B, still designing, actively designing things that are remotely on the same playing field of, of being as good or as relevant as the stuff that was heralded 20 years ago, and or C, um, the stuff that they actually made back then would sort of still be good by modern standards and wasn't just good because we, you know, we hadn't seen much back then, right? And, and would be kind of trite today. Um, I have a really hard time thinking of anyone who, who passes all those three tests. I can think of lots of tech people. I can't really think of any design people. So why is that, right? Um, I, I, don't, I don't actually know why that is. I, I could start rambling about it, but it probably would be a whole separate talk. Um, but my facetious way of doing, of saying this is, you know, we're here at this conference called Practice, right? Uh, this, is, this is for people who take seriously the art and the craft of game design, I'm, I presume, right? It's what it feels <laughs> like to me. Um, so who's the Bruce Lee of game design, right? Like if this is a practice, who's the total unbeatable badass who nobody else can touch, right? Who's even, <laughs> who's the half a Bruce Lee of game design? Um, I ask my question, this question of myself, and I say, well, there just isn't one. There really legitimately isn't one. Um, what does that say about this practice? <laughs> and those of us responsible for the practice and developing it in its depth and its, uh, leave it at depth. <laughs> so, Let's get back to talking about ambition for a second. Um, and I want to go back to John Carmack, John Romero type of thing. Um, it may be hard for younger people to understand today, uh, but this game in the early 90s was amazing, right? My response when I first saw this game, it looks like a pixelated mess to a modern viewer, but when I saw this running on my you know, home PC back when it came out, my, my response was like, oh my god, I didn't know that this was even possible on a computer. It was so exciting, right? Kind of like sending guys to the moon was exciting, right? It, it heralds some kind of future where things are just going to get cooler and, and cooler. 
Um, and part of what was impressive about this was tech. And if we're mostly focusing on design here, you might think, well, that's not too relevant. But it's relevant in a few different ways. First of all, I, I don't really think design and tech are all that separable because any really interesting groundbreaking design is going to need some tech behind it, probably. Not always. But it's a good, you need the tech to at least not conflict with what you do. Um, in this case, this was a case of very strong technology, but the design was also pretty strong, especially for back in the day. I mean, we would look at it today and say, oh, it's pretty simplistic, but this was a really, really well designed game. Um, the, and you can tell, or it's just clear from how big this hit that the design did not fail the technology, right? The technology was so amazing, and the design, like, held its own. It didn't, um, you know, you can look back at the history of games, and there's so many games that looked good but were horrible to play or whatever, and this wasn't one of those. So uh, there is that. But then also, again, I want to go back to that point about tech people staying in the industry for a long time and still doing relevant stuff and come at that from a different direction. Um, you might say this was really more of a tour de force of tech than it was of design. The design was good. Sorry to John Romero if he ever watches this. Um, <laughs> that's just how I personally feel about it. Um, this is really a tour de force of technology and not of design. But I don't really have to be that sorry to John Romero because if I look across the whole set of games, how many tour de forces of design actually are there? like that really stand up today, that you don't just say, well, okay, in context, because we didn't know better, that seemed really good. Like how many can you really still look back at today and say, wow, that was impressive. Like if I time traveled back to, you know, the early 90s, I could probably program Doom. I would have a hard time. It would be challenging to put it together in the way that they did at the time. I could design a better game than Doom now. That doesn't seem that hard, right? So, uh, Part of what that's saying is that design has advanced and we're better at what we do, but part of what that's saying is that uh, we're just not hitting that many really strong points in design, right? We're not, we're not hitting it out of the park all that often. So maybe uh, both in uh, tech and in design, it's a lot harder now. Like maybe we've picked all the low hanging fruit, certainly Technology-wise, it's hard to have the splash that Doom had now. You can't make a game with better graphics and have people really be impressed with that in the same way. Um, but who even has the thought to try these days, right? Who sits down and designs a game where they're trying to make the audience say, oh my god, I had no idea you could do that on a computer. Nobody that I know is even trying. Well, a couple people are mildly trying. Right? Um, there's this kind of fighting spirit that's not around anymore. Um, we used to really have it. Like, in the GDC, my first GDC was 1996, and like, everybody had some idea for some super ambitious game that was going to change the world. And we don't do that now, because we're all grizzled and hardened and stuff. Um, you know, I've been in indie most of the time, but you can see this moon landing effect in AAA. So, MMOs are kind of sort of the most, both technologically and design-wise, ambitious games that have been attempted by the industry. World of Warcraft is the last um, unambiguously successful MMO, right? A lot of games have come at after it that have basically tried to clone it. Um, as of this month, World of Warcraft is 10 years old, right? We kind of haven't done another moon landing after this. We, you know, we've done, we've done copycats that sort of crashed or whatever. Um, and really, you know, you might think of some other ambitious games like, oh, EVE Online. Well, EVE Online is actually a year older than this. That's from 2003, right? So <laughs> we have these games that are still somehow running, which is cool, uh, but we're, we're not being successful at, uh, at replicating them even, much less surpassing them, right? Um, and to, to be fair, when World of Warcraft came out, it was really kind of a lot like EverQuest. So it's not like, um, I, so I can't pin exactly, I, I'm not trying to place World of Warcraft at some kind of high point in game design, but I'm just saying there was generally some stuff that happened, and generally that's in the past now. And why is that, right? 
once in a while, a really a game with a spirit of ambition happens. So at E3 this year, uh, this game, No Man's Sky, was shown, and it got a really strong response. People were like, oh, wow, that's amazing. Um, this is actually the same kind of thing that people were talking about all the time in 1996 to 8. Um, hey, we're going to procedurally generate lots of crazy stuff, and you're going to be able to go visit. It's just closer to being able to be reality now, and, and somebody hasn't given up on that kind of vision, and people are really excited for that. Um, the fact that they're so excited for that is a signal that we're not really doing this that much anymore. Because if there were a lot of games like this, this wouldn't get that much attention, right? It's good that it's getting attention, but I also wish we had more of this, right? Anyway, so I was vaguely uh, aware of this kind of situation. When I started this game three in, 1990, or <laughs> in, in 2013, so I had a couple of goals. I was like, look, I, I don't feel like design is as hardcore as programming in terms of technology or seriousness of the practitioners. Design is very unconstrained. Your, your ideas in design are not so often tested clearly by reality. So it's just very easy to have random opinions and go for years believing that your random opinion is right. Whereas in programming, you kind of fail pretty fast if your opinions are too far wrong, right? So I was aware of that, and I said, well, you have to make up for it. Like, you know, if you're training in kung fu or something, you do exercises. You don't just look at your muscles and wish that they would get big and strong, right? Um, you do things to make your muscles strong. So part of what this was was an exercise. Like, I want to expand my abilities as a designer. I want to um, design something that's out of my comfort zone um, that'll make me better. And that was really fun. You know, it was... Um, Again, it was a conscious effort to build toward my own personal future, which was a little bit foreign to me because I was so used to like just toiling on, on these projects. Um, yeah. So, and design goals that I would have expressed, you know, without being too specific is, you know, I want this game to be like Gravity's Rainbow in a certain sense. Um, not in any really tangible sense, like I don't think you'll be able to take this game when it's out and hold it next to Gravity's Rainbow and draw correspondences, but there are aspects of the book that I really, really love. Like, it's a very high dynamic, ra dynamic range book. You have big things happening and small things happening, and you have um, massively important things happen, and you have like stupid trivialities where you're like, Should th did you really want to include that in the book, dude? Um, you know, and you have things that are very uh, tender, and you have things that are highly offensive. Um, and really this book is, it's not afraid to fly. Like it's not, um, and it, it's not, it's not afraid to leave you behind when it flies, right? It expects you to do some work and flap your wings and come with it, which is really something that we don't do very much in games anymore. Um, we learn not to do that because early games were so hard to learn. Um, but I think we could, we could go back and, and unlearn that a little bit. Um, while being keenly aware of the difference between flying and maybe leaving someone behind or just being arbitrarily hostile to that audience, right? So what does a 20-year project look like in concrete terms? Like some other ambitious thing, like sending a rover to Mars, you have to design for uh, the elements, right? I, I have to, whatever this project is, has to survive the weather and other environmental conditions between now and 20 years from now. It means it probably has to be self-funded, or if it's not, then uh, I somehow have to have some reliable way of convincing people to give me money 18 years in the future. I don't know how you do that. Um, I probably have to keep ownership of the project, which is related to self-funding, right? Like, it's not like I can get funding from Electronic Arts, and then they expect to own part of it, and that somehow doesn't bite me for 20 years and lets me do what I want to do. That's not going to happen, right? Um, you need to control the technical foundations of the project, because 20 years is a really long time. Platforms come and go. You know, if you build on your favorite game engine that you don't own and that you don't have the license to, 10 years from now or five years from now, you're going to need to switch platforms. and. Uh, it may be very difficult to switch platforms. They may be late doing it. Their support for that platform may be bad. They may decide not to support it. They may sell their company to Microsoft and then no long more development happens. Um, or they may choose to support that platform but charge uh, extortionate fees for that support, right? So you don't want to tie yourself to technical underpinnings. 
um, specific technical underpinnings that way. You can't really assume any particular life situation. So right now I'm fortunate in the sense that um, I've had a relatively successful game, gave me a lot of funding that I've now <laughs> mostly spent to build the next game. Um, but I've got a team working on this thing, and you can build bigger, more ambitious things when you have a team. Um, I don't know if that's the case 20 years from now, right? So what happens if I start to build this ambitious game structure with high production values and like really cool guys running around with like the most impressive shaders you've ever seen, and but you look at the code and it's just really hard to all hold in my head. Um, if I end up in a life situation where I no longer am working with a development team like that, uh, I may not be capable of con continuing and completing this series. So that lends considerable situation to what this series looks like at the beginning, right? Most people, like if, if I'm lucky and the witness breaks even, um, I'll have at least enough money left to do a similarly sized project, but I don't, um, I don't think it's necessarily wise to do a high production value project like that. Um, and then again, in terms of design constraint, um, like that series of fantasy novels, the design needs to feel complete but reopenable. You don't end one of those in the middle of a sentence or in the middle of a scene. I mean, you, you could. You'd be, you'd be very intentional if you did that, right? Um, in general, you want people to feel satisfied with what they've got and, and have space for more, to add more. And what does that mean in terms of game design? Well, I don't know, but it's not that much like a lot of game designs that already exist. So I, so I want to visit this level of production value. I've already implied that for life circumstance reasons, it may be a good idea to do a lower production value game. Um, but also for practice reasons, right? There's this idea of compound interest that um, I'm very concerned with these days. And I became aware of it in programming, right? I always, when people ask for advice in programming, I always say, well, you've, you've got to do it and you've got to make sure your tools are good and and just you don't put yourself in a life or work situation that prevents you from working effectively because the more programming you do, the better you get at programming, right? Which means you learn more faster, which means you get better at programming faster and your rate of accomplishing new things increases, which then allows you to learn more faster, et cetera, right? It's a feedback loop like we should be familiar with in game design, right? And uh, it's a lot like compound interest, right? So the same thing is true in design. Um, I don't think it's as tangible or as strong of an effect, but it's still true in design. So if I look at a 20-year project and I say one of my design goals is to achieve deep understanding, um, well, now suddenly, rather than being 20 years of me doing some vague things in life and how did that come out at the end, there's like a score at the end, right? It's like at the end of this project, how deep did the understanding go? And if I spend a lot of my design time dealing with production value kinds of issues, which inevitably happen, like, oh, when this guy's animation does this, we have to figure out what is most intact for the rest of the work to like do there, right? Um, that takes time, and it may take time away from depth of exploration of the subject. Um, on the other hand, Right? I know lots of designers who do very low production value games explicitly for the reason they say, oh, I just want to iterate and become a better designer. Um, I think that's a good idea, but if you, do, if you go too far that way, you miss part of game design, because part of game design is about nuance and subtlety, and you kind of can't explore certain dimensions of sub nuance and subtlety unless you have them in your game to begin with. Right? So production values help you that way, but they can really slow you down, right? And so in the past game or two, I may have erred a little too much in the other direction if my concern is deepest understanding. Or maybe I just needed to do that level of production value to build up skill to a certain level about nuance. And then now maybe I can just go straight there. Like you can make a very beautiful game. Like low production value doesn't necessarily mean ugly, right? You can make a beautiful game without so much infrastructure. Um, but, uh, well, I don't know. There's a, there's a lot of concerns. Um, one other concern is just objectively, not even just financially, but in terms of the enjoyment of your player, it's probably going to be decreased 
Um, you, uh, people, your game design gets better when it has nicer animations, right? Your game design gets better when the bitmaps look better. And a lot of people don't want to believe that, but I've found it to be true. All right, so if you're doing a 20-year project, a few other things click in your head, like investments suddenly make sense. Like the idea, oh, hey, I'll spend two years just making a programming language um, so that I can use it and be happier and more productive for these other 18 years. Suddenly, that's a sensible idea, whereas it may not have made sense before. Although weirdly, that's, a, again, another purely cognitive effect. Like I had been hoping to build games and get better at making games for 20 years at least anyway, right? But suddenly when there's a scorecard, <laughs> it makes things very, very visible, very concrete. Um, it makes you really consider those decisions carefully. So then the last thing I want to say about all this is, um, you know, I've decided to do a couple of ambitious things like this 20 year project and design a programming language and all that stuff. And I feel a really heavy weight has been lifted and it's that kind of weight of the grizzled veteran that I discussed that, that happens at conferences. You know, when I started out in games professionally in the mid 1990s, you know, I was trying to do things that were uh, ambitious and that nobody else had done. And, you know, they were uh, tilted toward technical things at that time, but there was also a good element of design ambition. And so I have, you know, this model in my head of what was happening, that there's some big space of unknown things and some space of known things. And we try to explore into the unknown territory and mark out areas with each new project. So, you know, I might go over in this corner and then try to shoot out to where that black dot is or go over there and try to shoot out to where that black dot is. And I haven't actually drawn new explored territory in this diagram because actually what would happen for me early on is I was always way too ambitious and these projects would not succeed in a meaningful way. Most of the learning that I got from them was, well, I won't do that again. Um, not totally true. Like I, my skills developed, but I had a lot of negative experiences. And so here's the thing about negative experiences and, and what happens a lot in the game industry. And so I want to explain, uh, I want to explain this operant conditioning experiment. And it involves a slight amount of animal cruelty, which is actually uh, sad, but we might as well understand what we came to understand through doing this, right? Um, there's a psychological phenomenon called learned helplessness, which is understood to be very active in, in humans, right? Um, you have a dog and you put him in a little uh, place where he can sort of hang out in both sides, but it's hard to get from one side to the other. You've got to jump this hurdle, right? And <laughs> the floor produces electric shocks one half at a time. And anytime you're going to instill a shock, right, you warn the dog by playing a sound on the speaker, like a little bell or something. And as we know from Pavlov's experiment, uh, dogs are really good at associating these two events. So the dog hears the noise. He's like, oh crap, I got to get out of here because I've been shocked the last couple of times. So he jumps to the other side and then he's safe, right? Happy dog. Unless you decide to be extra cruel to the dog and you tie him down to one side so he can't move. He can't jump. Um, and you do this before you've ever done the experiment. So he hasn't learned that he can jump yet, right? And uh, so now he has no choice but to get shocked every time. He hears the noise, he gets shocked. He tries to escape, maybe he can't do it. He hears the noise, he gets shocked. After enough time of this, you can remove the, the harness. He's no longer tied. Next time he hears the bell, he cowers and whimpers and gets shocked. He doesn't jump to the other side because what he's learned from all these experiences is that life sucks and he can't do anything, right? And that he's helpless. Uh, Whereas if you put a new, new dog in the experiment, he'll just jump away, right, after, after he's been shocked a couple times. This dog uh, may be a lost cause. So, and th this isn't limited to dogs, right? There's examples, you know, elephant trainers start out by tying elephants to a giant massive stake that, that really holds them in place. Elephants are huge beasts, but eventually you can use a much lighter stake because they're used to being tied to the stake and know they can't get away from it. So, um, let me relate that to this process. Early in my career and early in many people's careers, I think we tried to do a lot of ambitious things and failed a lot. And we learned that we failed and we said, well, we'll never do that again. Um, but times are different now for a lot of reasons. 
Um, you know, computers are faster. It's easier to do a lot of things on computers. Um, we can be better at what we do. So uh, this is a mathematician named Paul Erdős who died a little while back. Um, he was very, very prolific. He wrote uh, over 1,500 mathematical papers, all presenting new results in mathematics. Um, he, uh, he's renowned for many things, kind of an eccentric guy, uh, but one of the talents that he had was the ability to gauge a problem and know exactly what is the right thing to attack right now, what's too hard, I'll just get frustrated, and what's, you know, what's easy enough that maybe it's not worth bothering with, we'll let someone else do that, right? And that's a skill that you can build that I think I was not very good at 20 years ago, and I think most people in the games industry were not so good at 20 years ago, right? So this territory that I was envisioning as well, there's sort of a line here, right? It might be more fractal, right? It probably has areas of higher difficulty and lower difficulty, and the ability to discern those shades is a skill that you can have and that I believe I've built at least a little bit. So instead of trying to plow through from this obvious point up front to get there, right, maybe you can sort of come through this lighter path on the side and, and cut over from the right and only have to plow through dense jungle for about a third of the distance as you could have or as you would have had to, right? Or maybe you just say, well, you know, that black point there that I was trying to get to is a little bit arbitrary. Why don't I just place it even deeper into this territory at the tip of this easy to reach place, right? That's a skill that I think I'm starting to observe among game designers, but only just starting, right? But once we're armed with it, I think we can do a lot better than we ever did. Um, also, a lot of us have a lot more experience at uh, at the brawn of making games. We've just made some projects, right? Back 20 years ago, you know, there were some people who had made some projects, uh, but they, they were dinkier, like computers were getting bigger, games were getting a lot more ambitious. Like these days, um, if you're experienced, the experience is yours, right? And if you're new, there are a lot of people with a lot of experience that's relative to, or relevant to what you're trying to do that you can learn from very quickly, right? We never had that. And, and the last reason why we can be more ambitious now is just that we've got maps of this territory of all these failures, right? And we can use those maps. And we, we haven't been using them lately. And uh, it's a little bit of a shame. So let me go back to Bruce Lee for the conclusion here. Um, there's an inspirational quote, right? And I've, I've expressed my cynicism for inspirational quotes. Uh, but, but Bruce Lee says, if you always put limits on everything you do, physical or any, everything, anything else, it will spread into your work and into your life. There are no limits. There are only plateaus. And you must not stay there. You must go beyond them. And there was a time in the past when, you know, I would have looked at something like this and said, yeah, yeah, OK. Words of wisdom, that's great. Um, but the more that I have experience in these kind of areas, the more that I understand that this statement is literally true. He meant it. And it's true. And if we choose to ignore this sentiment, we're doing it for reasons of, you know, ego protection, for reasons of wanting to feel good about where we are now compared to the immense potential of where we could be, right? Um, and the reason I'm talking all about, uh, you know, learned helplessness and, and plateaus and all this stuff is that this is exactly what I observed, not just in the games industry, but in myself. Um, I still manage to do some pretty ambitious things. When, when The Witness comes out, I think people will agree it's pretty ambitious. Um, but I also think I can do more now, and it's time to do more. So not all games have to be big and ambitious. You know, small games are beautiful. And like I said, we're, we've staked out some territory of game design. And lately, we have a lot of games that are being very creative in terms of sort of finding little crevices inside the existing territory and filling them out. You know, like a game like Gone Home or, or Papers, Please or something like that are very, very nice uses of the existing territory. And there's totally nothing wrong with that. I'm very glad that we have those games. And it's been a wonderful addition to, to get them because we sort of didn't have them for a while. So I'm not knocking that stuff at all. I think we need more of that. Um, but I also think there's this very crucial element of explorative ambition that we're missing, right? We're missing people who want to go to the moon and want to go to Mars. And, and we've been missing that for a while. And the fact that we've been missing it is subtle, 
so subtle that I didn't even clearly realize it until I sat down to prepare this talk. So that's it. Um, some of us know that this kind of ambitious moonshot thing is our department. I've always felt that that was my department. Like I got into games wanting to do super ambitious things and I want to do them now. And I feel that it's time to do them. I feel that we as an industry are once again ready and that I'm ready. So thanks for listening to me ramble and that's all I've got to say. time but maybe I, I is there a time for one question just for you know to, to for for you know formalists like no minutes. no that's good that was it was a beautiful talk and but I just I feel uncomfortable if we don't have at least one question so one quick question then we'll give everybody a nice uh, coffee break and then we'll come back yeah Yeah, so, so I'm, I'm familiar with that. I, I, I can't answer that question. Should I re repeat it a little bit? Um, yeah, mathematicians yeah. are doing their important work. When you they're know, when, they're, when, they're, when you're 25 is yeah. sort of the, the figure. So I can't answer this competently because I'm not really a mathematician or a physicist, but I know of this idea the same as you do. Um, on the one hand, I guess maybe that's true, but on the other hand, like, you know, Leonard Susskind is kind of a badass. He's more of a badass than Batman, and he ain't young. Um, there's a lot of people like that. Um, and I feel like, you know, my personal impression is that as math and physics have become, you know, there's some wavefront of what you know and how much you need to know to get to that wavefront of new understanding. And that keeps getting pushed back as understanding uh, becomes deeper, right? And so I think that, and really this is not a competent answer, but I think that that may be changing over time simply because there's more to know before you get to the real stuff. Um, but I don't, I don't know. Why, I'm sorry, Leonard. Why, why did I say that about Leonard Susskind? I mean, there's, there's a number of physicists who are like serious dudes who are not 25, for example. Um, I have one, one last question. Will game three be written in highlight? Um, game three is currently in C++, uh, but I may rewrite it in another programming language. I probably will, because it'll be a good test of whether that language is practical. Nice. Yeah. Awesome. That's exciting. Yeah. Um, thank you very much. Why don't we take...